Um, the word surrealism was coined by uh, Guillaume Apollinaire for the program notes to Eric Satie's ballet Parade, and this is the music from Parade playing in the background. Unsurprisingly, surrealist Salvador Dali had a strange theory of architecture. Dali saw such a strong relationship between morality and architecture that he said that architecture creates moral structures and ethics. Surrealism was grounded in Freudian psychology, so surrealist architecture recognizes that morality is both externally mandated but also internally imposed through a hard sadistic superego pressing into a soft masochistic ego. Possibly to compensate for the necessary severity of the superego, Dali advocated for hedonistic architecture. Consequently, whenever he made predictions about the future of architecture, the architectural, the moral, and the psychological were intertwined with images of hardness and softness. The most memorable of Dali's predictions, the one he repeated most often, was contained in an anecdote about meeting Le Corbusier in the 1920s which he first relayed in 1956 with his incendiary booklet La Cocus de Vie Art Moderne. Although a direct translation of the French title would have been The Cockholds of the Old Modern Art, he was given the less sensational title of Dali on Modern Art when published in English the following November. Here, Dali focused his lampoon as contempt for the art of his contemporaries. Dali described a scene we might find today familiar Leftist progressives over decades slowly and inexorably moving over to occupy the intolerant hegemonic right. With a terribly elegant lack of self-aware irony, these grey-haired self-declared radicals now accepted and awarded each other honorary degrees and gold medals for once having tried to assassinate painting. Dali argued that their inability to perpetually transform to be living artists rather than the fossils of past ideologies stemmed from their beliefs about art. They had been betrayed by the ugly, betrayed by the modern, betrayed by the technical, and betrayed by the abstract. In the context of this lampoon, Dali recounted lunching with the director of the Louvre, Georges Sales, and Le Corbusier decades ago. Le Corbusier was, typically, boring the lunch guests, repeating over and over again his theories of architectural functionalism. So, Dali wrote, When I was barely 21 years old, I happened to be having lunch one day in the company of the masochistic and Protestant architect Le Corbusier, who, as everyone knows, is the inventor of the architecture of self-punishment. Le Corbusier asked me if I had any ideas on the future of his art. Yes, I had. I have ideas on everything, as a matter of fact. I answered him that architecture would become soft and hairy. In listening to me, Le Corbusier had the expression of one swallowing gall. Decades later, Dali expanded his critique. After a period of stupefying rigidity and failing unsuccessful functionalism, we will come to know the ignominious and sublime ooziness of internal secretions. Along with floating kidneys, we get floating engines, limp engines for the limp period, the period of limp watches, limp automobiles, limp night tables, as foretold by the mediums of modern style, his term for Art Nouveau, those who created the celebrated Limp Cathedral of Barcelona. These are the central salivary systems running heatedly through the streamlined curves of the imminent limp, vaginal, rounded, ornamental, imperial, recreational, imaginative, anxiety-ridden, vice-addicted, and surrealistic houses. Get behind me, architecture of self-punishment, Make way for the perverse, glandular, prime quality streamlining. Surrealism's aesthetic moral project effectively asserted that new aesthetics arises from discovering new or concealed desires. Hence, aesthetic discovery, and therefore always the future of art and architecture, is to be found in the ridiculous, in the shameful, 
and in the repressed. In his essay on the terrifying and edible beauty of Art Nouveau architecture, Dali described Art Nouveau as shamefully arousing a great primal hunger. Elements of Art Nouveau buildings that could not be understood as having any apparent purpose would be of use for the functioning of desires, desires that are, moreover, the most shady, discredited, and shameful. The two apartment buildings that Gaudi designed in the Paso de Gracias, Dali described as edible houses, the first and only truly eroticized buildings, whose existence is proof of a formation that is urgent and needful for the amorous imagination to be able to really and truly eat the object of desire. Two, days after this, two decades after this prediction, Dali was able to build a prototype of an architecture that eats. In 1957, an American magazine asked Dali for his predictions on the future of architecture, and he said there will be a reaction against rigid rectilinear architecture. Buildings of the future will be soft and pliable. They will change form constantly according to changes in atmospheric pressure and temperatures. And more than half a century later, this has the uh, impression of being something of a prediction, but it was actually a description of a building that Dali had already designed and would be completed within the year. In March of 1957, Dali had been commissioned by Spanish entrepreneur Cesar Balsa to design a nightclub in Acapulco. Dali sent Balsa his design with a tongue-in-cheek attitude conceived as a 30-foot high sea urchin held 40 feet off the ground by four insect legs and a central seashell containing a walkway and an elevator, all seemingly being pulled out of the water by 140-foot tall giraffes made from the local rocks. The nightclub's bar was planned to imitate the movements of the stomach of an octopus. In May 1958, the newspapers reported that there was some difficulty building it. Quoting, a year now has passed and Balsa can't find anyone to tackle the project. By this time, however, Dali's second architectural commission was already under construction. The pharmaceutical corporation Wallace Laboratories, marketing the tranquilizer, the anxiolytic Milltown, commissioned Dali to design a pavilion for the American Medical Association's annual convention held in June in San Francisco. Dali produced a description and three watercolors, allowing artists René Dorzec and Victor Aratze, the engineer, to build his 60-foot tall, 60-foot long design called Chrysalida. The pavilion was constructed from 13 wooden ribs crisscrossed with a steel lattice, with 116 lights attached to the structure. The frame was wrapped inside and out with a translucent white parachute silk. The chrysalida was also equipped with 24 motors powering air blowers that enable the building to breathe and writhe, inhaling for five seconds and exhaling for 15 seconds, changing color and shape and moving with atmospheric pressure as Dali had predicted. Dali wrote, the outer structure of the chrysalida, quote, is that of a chrysalis maximum symbol of the vital nirvana which paves the way for the dazzling dawn of the butterfly in its turn the symbol of the human soul. Inside, organic forms appear in forced perspective showing the surrealist pattern of a harmonious life. The first figure, by its tormented colloidal roots, portrays human anxiety. The second symbolizes the chrysalis on its way to being transformed, a metamorphosis directly toward the harmonious tranquility which hatches into the third image, the flowery-headed maiden, a repeated theme in Dali's work, the, the flowery-headed maiden, the, the vegetal is the symbol of irrepressible, unstoppable life, and the true butterfly of tranquility. The analogy of the chrysalis Dali understood personally, telling reporters that telling reporters at the time that a key ingredient to his creativity was to disappear from public life and for long periods each year in isolation produce his art. Back home in Port Legat, a few months after the convention, Dali told a reporter, every year Dali disappears, remains in seclusion in the most tranquil of spots, California, Monterey, or here, perhaps the most tranquil place in the world. After nine months of complete solution, my life becomes a chrysalis. This is heaven, P. 
peace, nirvana. So these outline uh, these are all the statements Dali made on his predictions of the future of architecture. And I'd like to uh, recontextualize this with uh, the language of modern psychology rather than the language of Freudian psychology in response to some of the comments that have been made along the way today. I think Dali's general aesthetic preference, which he sketched out in, on several occasions as a morphological aesthetic theory of the hard and soft, and that if you look through Dali's paintings, you'll notice that, that the, one of the, the consistent themes, aside from, of course, straight up realism, is uh, the union of hard and soft objects, or, or harmony, or a balance, or I'm not really sure quite what the word would be, but there's always the hard and the soft in some form of relationship to each other. And in modern, Modern psychology in the last 15 years, we've been working on through psychometric data and producing the, the boundary construct, uh, particularly the, the Hartman boundary construct, which talks about uh, thick and thin boundaries, which we might want to describe as um, clear rectilinear boundaries compared to soft boundaries or um, hard impermeable boundaries and permeable boundaries. And that both kinds of boundaries are relatively equally distributed through the population. And it turns out, in a general sense, that people who like hard, rigid boundaries in one area of, that, of their life, whether that's architecturally, politically, nationally, and even conceptually, like hard boundaries all across those, those domains. And people who like open, fluid, porous, blurry boundaries prefer open, porous, blurry boundaries in all manner of life. And one of the psychological problems that we de developed out of this is that if you are a person on one side of the spectrum, it's easy for you to say and to argue that it's good to have blurry boundaries. It's good to think of things as being porous. And if you're on the other side of the domain, you say, it's good that we have strong, hard, rigid boundaries. It's good that concepts are clearly defined. And as long as we think that only one of those is correct, we are in going to exist in a permanent state of conflict. So perhaps the permanent state of conflict is necessary from a Heraclitean sense. I think the, the form of artistic classicism that Dali was working towards was the development of a wisdom in relationship to those two conditions. So that if you are the kind of person who likes hard, rigid, narrowly defined concepts, you attain some form of wisdom by, by understanding the value of porous, blurry boundaries. But if you are the kind of person who always favors open borders, blurry boundaries, soft concepts, you attain some form of wisdom by understanding the virtue and the necessity of hard, clear, unchanging boundaries. And it is through this form of wisdom that I think that the idea of a living, ongoing, utopian condition can actually emerge and not stay as an impossible, distant future. Thank you, everybody.